this colonial pipeline thing, you know, um, you know, everybody's getting hit by ransomware. Probably one of the first times that's actually realistically happened to a mass population. And is there anything the company can do about that other than just not having stupid people? The Biden administration, you know, are they going to do anything about this? This is where I do actually side with our friends over in the Far East. Why don't we build, you know, a secure network? And by the way, responsibility includes if you don't get your house in order and your shit together, you come in with me and you can spend the next couple of years staring at concrete walls. End of discussion. Welcome back to Generally Speaking. We have uh, Chris Roberts back. He's going to talk to us about the Colonial Pipeline attack. We're going to talk about uh, the Florida almost water poisoning. We're going to talk about the Memphis bombing and a whole lot more. Uh, we're going to get into what the what the country is or is not going to do about it. So I'm looking forward to the conversation. I think you're going to love it too. So Chris, welcome back, and it's great to have you back. Yeah, uh, absolute pleasure and honor to be back on again. So definitely. So so Chris, this Colonial Pipeline thing, you know, um, you know, everybody's getting hit by ransomware, but when it affects uh, you at the gas pump, that's really when people start to, <laughs> to take notice. You know, I was looking at these people that were lining up in, uh, as, as some of these stations ran out of gas in North Carolina. So can you walk people through, you know, your, um, your sense of how that uh, was pulled off and, you know, what, what can a company like Colonial do about it? What should they do about it? And more importantly, what can the government do about it? And are they going to do anything about it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, the, the, that was a good one because it, it really made people sit up and think. And I think it's probably one of the first times that's actually realistically happened to a mass population in more than just a couple of places. So again, standard standard operating brief. As an attacker, as an adversary, I'm going to look at you and I'm going to go, OK, how can I get into you? Can I get you to click something? Can I send in an email? Can I get you to go to a website? Which is pretty much so what happened. So very easy, very normal way of an attacker or an adversary being able to break into something. We see it, unfortunately, almost every single minute of the day we're across the globe. Then what ended up happening is the attackers turned around and said, OK, we can make some money out of this. You know, we're in a very vulnerable environment. We're in a network that has plenty of computers, plenty of systems, plenty of infrastructure that we can start to encrypt and that we can start to basically take advantage of. So they were able to, in the physical world, they were able to get into somebody's house pretty easily because the door wasn't really locked very well. So they'll kind of nudge against the door and I'm in. And then when I'm in, no alarms are going off, silent or otherwise. Nobody's coming to chase me. Nobody's running at me with weaponry. Well, let me have a rummage around and see what I can find. So as an attacker, you start rummaging around, you're like, there's some kind of good stuff here. Let's see how we can take advantage of this. And so they started to, you know, encrypt computers. Now, the difference is on this one is the encrypted system and they put systems offline that obviously control, you know, the, some of the most critical East Coast pipeline systems that we have today. Because, again, if we use the house analogy, when the house is maybe connected to your car garage, which is maybe also connected to a few other things, and I can move easily just by opening another door and going, hey, look, there's, oh, there's some cool classic cars here. Hey, let's grab those. And, you know, you go through that and you go into the, the storage shed and you realize that the storage shed's got a whole bunch of antique like John Wayne stuff. And then they're like, hey, quit, bring up the truck. Let's grab all of that stuff, too. And so if using the physical energy, they were just able to move from room to room to room and just basically take whatever they wanted, or in this case, encrypt everything that they wanted. And at that point, you go from because both the, comp the regular computer networks that we all think about, the office computer networks, were in a, in a position to be able to affect the pipeline networks. So if you think about it, a pipeline isn't just carrying, you know, oil and gas and everything. It has sensors to measure the flow, to measure the pressure, to measure temperature, to measure how effective. And, you know, you, every now and again, you'll see them. It, they're amazing screens. They've got the shapes of the pipelines on them. And across all of them, there's all these controllers. Years ago, those controllers were completely separated from a regular corporate computer network. There was just no way of accessing the two of them. And then some bright spark said, well, we don't, we don't want so many people out in the field. We'll kind of get rid of them. We'll pension them off and we'll plug the two networks together and it'll be fine. 
Well, as we know, obviously it isn't fine because we didn't put any controls in place to restrict the connectivity between the two. And then also what's happened is I'll come along and I'll sell you some new sensors for the network and you'll plug them in. And because I don't want to have to go out into the field and look at the damn things, I'm going to say to you, hey, in order for me to sell you these sensors, I need to be able to access them. And you're like, all right. And you give me access to them. And it's basically a direct connection straight into the sensor network. Unfortunately, a lot of times bypassing any security controls that might or might not be in place. So it's basically like giving me the keys to where you store your, you know, 1950s and 1960s and 70s high boys and saying, ah, it's fine. Just go in and check them and, you know, don't worry about it. And I give enough of these sets of keys out. And of course, now I'm trusting all of my third parties. I'm trusting my suppliers and my vendors. You know, as well as I do, that sometimes the easiest way to take somebody out is not go through the front door. It's to take them out through their friends, their family, their colleagues and everybody else. And it's the same thing. I'm not going to maybe necessarily kick the front door of the company down. I'm going to look to see if their weakest points are their transportation or their vendors or supply chain. In this case, they just kick the front door down. But yeah, sometimes you might get it right. Well, the uh, when I was uh, when I first started working on this U.S. China thing, I remember reading the briefing where uh, the guy who was a football fan um, he got sent a newsletter, and inside mm -hmm. that newsletter was a uh, was a link uh, that ended up being just like what you talked about. And so a lot of this um, is social engineering or human engineering, if you will. So the vulner the big vulnerability that you're saying uh, that occurred here in Colonial was not so much the the system as it was the people that are in within the system. And now, is there anything the company can, can other than telling the people to stop clicking link, which I know <laughs> we get all this, you know, in the, in the military, you get computer-based training, which, you know, I, I just absolutely hated. Um, and it's like, don't click the links. Like, who, what idiots clicking links, you know? Actually, when I was in, when I was in the Pentagon, the joint, st joint staff got hacked by the Russians for the same exact yeah. reason. And then, then, and then we all had to go to a room and they say, don't click the links. I'm like, come on, guys. <laughs> but we send out a link on the calendar so you can click the link to go to the meeting that says don't click the link. Right, but then there's a seal on the email and you know, <laughs> you know you, 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 yeah yeah you're you no know, yeah. you're preaching to the choir here. Right. But, but I mean is there anything the company can do about that other than just not having stupid people, I guess. I, I, there's a ton we can do. I mean that's that I think again is where the frustration is. There's so much we could have and should do. First and foremost, we can educate the people, you know, and you're right. The problem is if I come up to you, I, I know the training you probably went through once a year or maybe once a quarter if they were advantaged, they run you through the same training that they ran you through last year. And you already know what the answers are because you remember them from the year before the last year when you did the stupid things. So we do click, the same click, stuff. Click, click, click. Exactly. Yeah, I'm done. Okay, now great. Another cup of coffee. So we do the same stuff and we do it once a year. And let's face it, we're humans. We, we remember things for what, 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes if we're lucky. So once a year, I tell you, don't click it, don't send it, don't do stuff you shouldn't do. That's going to last maybe until lunchtime, maybe till the end of the day. We also don't engage. I'm not going to look at you and go, hey, let me help you protect not just yourself and the organization you're with, but let me help you protect your kids or the family and the friends around you, parents, grandparents, whatever. Let me help you protect those and here's how. So that's one. We educate the humans way more effectively. It's also a lot cheaper to do that. Secondly, the very computers we use, there are so many things that we can do. Yeah, you know what? Everybody's going to click something. Great. So now I can put something on the computer that says, hey, for the last month, General, you know, you, you've done these things, but hang on, you're now starting to do things at two o'clock in the morning or your computer is starting to ask questions of the rest of the network. Your computer is starting to talk to China. I'm not sure I really want it doing that. Let's have a quiet conversation about it. So there's so many things we can do. Right. And there's so many ways right. we can pull that info. We just we just don't always do it or we don't why, think why, why why then why wouldn't a colonial who you know is absolutely reliant on the fact that it piped its pipeline why wouldn't they do that because it takes time it takes effort and it's it this is the stuff where you literally have to roll the sleeves up crack the fingers and get the basic simple stuff done it's much easier to get wooed by somebody who comes in and goes, oh, I'll take care of all this thing. And basically don't look behind the green, but don't look behind the green curtain. 
in the security industry, there are simple things that a lot of us can and should do. And unfortunately, they tend to get ignored and we tend to forget to simplify and do the easy stuff. And we tend to focus on, you know, hey, let's put something. The vendor told me it was artificial intelligence or it's quantum entanglement computing and it'll solve all of my problems and it's 100 percent effective. We tend to get wooed by all of that and we tend to ignore the very simple stuff. And it's it, it takes time. It takes time and it takes resources. It takes it takes work to do this. The um, so you know the the maybe the company didn't want to spend the money, maybe it didn't want to take the time. Um, you know, obviously corporate executives still aren't being held account to these uh, for these types of things happening. Um, you know, what what could the government do? You know, if if the co if the company's not going to do anything, I want my damn gas. Yeah. What can the government do? And so what? Can, and so this actually. This is where I do actually side with our friends over in the Far East. This is this is the one time I'm actually going to side with them. I told you to fix your problem. I even gave you the opportunity. I gave you the resources. I gave you the compliance framework, NIST 853, SB. If you continue to be a complete numpty and you can do it, I'm pulling a truck up. I'm going to knock on your board of directors door and you're all coming with me. End of discussion. No trial. No collect 200. No. Bye bye. We're going to go have a conversation. You might be back. You might not be. Don't wait up for us. That's one of the <laughs> few times I actually agree with those guys. Because what we do nowadays is we're like, well, you know, you really shouldn't do that. Bad people. You know, we'll fine you a couple of million. Um, and then that gets passed on to the consumer, unfortunately. So that's what annoys me. We've seen it in retail, we've seen it in healthcare bad person you shouldn't have lost those 80 million records we're going to find you 10 million what happens our flipping insurance premiums go up yeah how effective is that one what we need to do honestly is look at the entire board of directors and go look first and foremost we're going to educate you as to what you have to understand from a risk standpoint so that's on the CISO let's face it it's on the CISO and the CTO chief information security officer chief technology officer it's on us to better inform and better communicate to the board of directors it's on the board of directors and those people that are obviously in charge. Let's face it, shit should roll uphill. So you know this as a general, you are you are responsible for people, for humans, for lives and everything else. You are held accountable for those actions. In the civilian world, unfortunately, that shit kind of rolls downhill. I don't want it. I literally, somebody needs to walk up to the CEO's office, knock on the door and say, I'm holding you responsible for the very simple fact that you failed. And by the way, responsibility includes if you don't get your house in order and your shit together, you come in with me and you can spend the next couple of years staring at concrete walls. End of discussion. So you're 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 a big uh, you're you're a hard ass on when it comes to this, but you know what? <laughs> we need to. Lo I mean, we, we, no, we, I I agree with you, but uh, logically that's not going to happen. So what? So you know, the, the Biden administration. You know, are they going to do anything about this? I mean. You, you were talking before the before the start of that that you thought that they might. So what, what do you think that they might do, or uh, or or do you think this is just uh, they're blowing smoke? So they they literally, ironically enough, in, in the conversation, they literally just put out a directive which which has said to critical infrastructure, and I think they've just done it for pipeline, which says that you know you, you now have uh, and it's hours, it's like twelve hours to notify us, and this is like the U.S. cert things, I think to notify us of a breach. Well, great, but how are you gonna handle it? How are you gonna deal with it? What are you gonna do about it? Are you, so are we now gonna be on the hook from the government standpoint, are we now gonna be on the hook for deploying a team out? Because again, you can't take care of your own house. You can't keep your own house in order. Does that literally mean we have to babysit you? Probably yes for the minute, but I mean, so there's, there's definitely more of the, we're removing the voluntary breach because what it used yeah. to be is what would happen is if you got breached, you'd get the boardroom together, you get senior leadership and you'd bring the lawyers in and you and then you'd have a conversation as to, well, did we get breached or was it just something that happened? Did anything get lost? Yes or no. Can we prove that it got lost? Do we have to tell anybody? And so that's where so it comes don't from. don't you don't you think that that's probably going to be the first thing that happens even with this twelve hour you know the lawyer is going to come in there and say don't don't say anything they don't have any they don't have the authority or jurisdiction you know is this going to be one of those another one of those executive orders like Trump had he had I think he had like seventy five thousand executive orders and 
uh, the court nullified 75,000 of them. So, you know, uh, as unconstitutional or whatever, I don't know. But it, it, do you think that's what's going to happen here? So, so yes, they say, they make it look like they're doing something, but then the attorneys are going to come and say, well, they don't really have jurisdiction here. I, I got a feeling there's going to be fight back on it. No two ways about it. Because yeah. exactly to your point, it's like, well, hang on, I got to notify within 12 hours. The flip side is, is also within seven days, and I think that's seven days of, of whenever this goes into effect, is they have to notify basically TSA, DHS, and some other folks, CISA, um, mm -hmm. about what they do have in place. So, Which means they've just notified the market, which means it impacts the stock, which means yeah uh, they all get fired that yeah. so so but so basically you just told your your c-suite that um the, my my new executive order is you tell me so you can be fired that's yeah. gonna that's that's not gonna work no. um and that's so it. it's, yeah, yeah it, it's just it's it's a hard problem the um the the other thing that really happened um you know since i talked to you last was the memphis bombing in um in uh, AT and T's uh, data center, and it took yeah. down um, it took down FirstNet, it took down uh, AT and T, and some other uh, networks for two or three days in that area, and, and not just in Tennessee, but other surrounding states as well. In yeah. fact, you had cell towers that were within range of each other that couldn't talk to each other because your core was down. So, yeah. um, so you know, what, what are we doing about, um, you know, we have a highly kind of uh, hub and spoke centralized data center type infrastructure today. You know, even a tier three data center has redundant, you know, uh, fiber, redundant power, but if it goes offline, it's offline. And, yeah. and there's only a few of them. So, you know, what are, you know, what are we doing about that? What do you think we can do about that or should do about that? So it's, 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 um, We've seen similar attacks, not at the physical level, but at the digital level, the DNS types of attacks. And then there's been a ton of attacks on what we call the call routers. So how the internet traffic moves across. There have been some massive attacks in the last six, 12 months where you're talking, I mean, we always talk about denial of service type attacks where somebody just floods a network pipe to try to bring service down. We keep seeing more and more of those and they keep getting, I mean, they're massive attacks now. The thing we can do, you know, as well as I do, is it all comes down to delivery. It all comes down to your supply chain is how can I make my supply chain more redundant, more resilient? If I lose this data center, what are the consequences and knock on effects of losing this? Well, can I have a secondary data center where I can do replication? Well, I can, but there's a cost with that. So we can. And, and so the best way of looking at this is uh, and we've had long conversations about this behind the scenes. When you look at computer servers, we always talk about what's known as RAID configuration, so redundancy configuration, and we see it in encryption, we see it in all sorts of other things. Um, and it's, if I have a piece of information, how many times do I have to split bits of that up to then, worst case scenario, if I split it up into five pieces, I lose two, those three that are left can rebuild my information. There's a company out of the UK, actually it's out of Scotland, that's actually building a really interesting like distributed rate architecture, totally cool guys. Um, and they can lose three data centers out of seven and you can still rebuild the information. So I think that's what's gonna actually happen is we're gonna take that whole, con we're seeing it, you'll take that whole concept of a hard drive raid We've moved it to server and cloud RAID, and now we're going to move it to like physical location type of RAID. So I'll take my one piece of important data and I'll spread it geographically, disperse it. If I lose the East Coast and Midwest, well, I can still pick it up from Mountain, West, and you know Florida or well, Texas. I'll just put a couple of days. We'll just put it all in Texas. I mean, they've just removed all the armaments laws. We're pretty safe down there now. <laughs> But so, but even if you've got a RAID configuration and you've got yeah. a you've got a uh, you've got some kind of um, you know malware in there, yeah. that that can that's that's propagating across your your platform. Oh. What is the uh, what is the way to prevent you know to have you know say you do say it is malware that locks up. It's like let's go back to Colonial and say they have yeah. they have redundant systems. What's what is the kind of the best practices of making sure that if you do get something like ransomware uh, and you want to quickly kind of go over to the next system, uh, but you want to make sure that that ransomware wasn't uh, in that old system, kind of what is the best practice today about 
making sure that you've got a backup that's not as corrupted as your primary. You hit this word exactly, and I was actually reaching for it, is, is what you do is, is you take one of these wonderful things called a hard drive or a tape unit, and you take it out and you just put it off to the side. It's that complete ability to have an offline recovery capability. And I think we've forgotten that. You know, we used to have that. We all knew tape drives. We all knew you had that capability. We didn't put complete separation, segmentation between our active system and our oh shit system when you think about it. Um, you know, I always remember once every couple of days, you know, the truck would turn up, I'd hand them drives, they'd hand me the other ones to use, and off we go. Worst case scenario, if I can't recover from my RAID architecture, I can go back two days, pull my backups, and I'm back up online. I mean, I basically strip, I completely strip everything off the computer systems, or I bring in bare metal, whatever, so I got to do it, rebuild it, and I'm done. So, so basically, you have some kind of air gap between um, whatever you're going to use to restore, uh, restore operation, and um, and where you know, and the current system that's 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 corrupted. I I'd want. I mean, I mean, yeah, we we're gonna have a long conversation about air gaps and stuff like that. I I literally I want it offline. I want the darn thing turned off. Yeah. And I want yeah. it. Yeah. I I want a human. To, I want sneak in it. I want a human no. to have to walk. To pick it up and get moving on it. Got yeah. it. So, um, so the other one that that recently happened, I don't know if you remember, was the uh, in Florida. They some guy sitting there, you know, drinking his coffee, and he, yeah. <laughs> he, he start he he uh, his he doesn't, but his his machine starts adding lye to the to the water supply. Um, yeah. What you know? What happened there? And, oh, and you know, is this the same same thing as uh, as Colonial? No, well, yes and no. Um, Colonial had some challenges that they were aware of that they didn't fix, unfortunately. In this case, this was this was convenience over security. And I think that's probably the best way of putting it. This was, I need to access your computer instead of me having to go through a VPN and having to go through these things. Hey, do me a favor. Can you just open up a remote software for me? I'll get in. It'll be fine. And so we do that a couple of times. And then, well, hang on. I need to get in once a week. Why don't you just leave it open for me and I'll get in when I need to. And that's great, except you know as well as I do, any kind of remote software that's directly connected to the internet is like a shining beacon in the darkness for anybody who's an adversary. And unfortunately, they're all pretty darn easy to break into. And in this case, our uh, intrepid uh, water treatment plant left TeamView open and, and on the internet, and somebody came in very enterprisingly and decided to help them out. Well, so, you know, <laughs> this stuff is, I mean, it's actually pretty easy. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah, this isn't, and, and it's, it's not like it's it's rocket science. It's it's um, y you you wonder, um, you know, one of the things one of my um, assertions when I was in the White House was, why don't we build, you know, a secure network? And we basically have that for the military. We run all our SCADA systems through that. We run all our, you know, critical stuff like, you know, our telecommunications networks are. Our, our, our electrical grid, SCADA systems, our water supply systems. We just have a, you know, for lack of a better word, industrial internet for the United States. Yeah. Um, you know, that, uh, what do you think about that idea? I mean, we're, we're, we're getting ready to spend hundreds of billions of dollars uh, in building infrastructure, uh, if, if, if this administration can be believed. Why wouldn't we go about um, building a network to protect, you know, the water thing, you protect the, the um, you know AT and T's data center to protect the uh, Colonial pipeline and any other thing that we find critical for you know to survive. I think we need to do. We have to do. We've got to do something different than we're doing now. No two ways about it. Um, my uh, and this is where it gets interesting. I mean, you, you, we all know from from the military doc updates the Sipanet Nipanet architectures and and the challenges on getting to them and some of the other ones. And so. I like that concept. Now, the only challenge on anything like that one is if, let's take Colonial, perfect example. If you draw a box around Colonial and say, look, we've got you covered. We will come in with our own networks, our own infrastructure, our own systems. We then have to educate Colonial to go, hey, the vendor and supplier 
you know, Amazon with its little boxes, they can't come in. We're not allowing them to come into your into here, into there. We have to give them access. So we've got to be much better at how we gatekeep it. We've got to be much better at how we manage it, control it, enforce it. I mean, we can do it. The controls are there. This isn't, again, to your point, this isn't rocket science. This is actually pretty easy stuff to do. We just have to build it and effectively put the policies and controls around it so that we can manage it and just keep a bloody eye on the damn thing. I mean, that's it. It's not that hard to do. Yeah, and it seems like it's something that we should do. Yeah. I'm gonna throw a curb. I'm gonna throw a curveball at you here. So, um, in uh, la early last year, uh, Imperial College of London put out a report that said two million Americans were gonna die because of the coronavirus. Now, um, who do you think took a trip to Imperial College of London back in 2015? Our friend Xi Jinping. Oh, interesting. Boy. So, so, so we've been talking about hacking systems. Yeah. Um, what, what, have, have you done any work and have you done any thinking on uh, hacking of minds? Because, Ooh. you know, what I, what I say uh, the coronavirus was, uh, it wasn't a bio attack. It was a, it was a information operation and it was very much related to uh, con further contr strengthening control over the supply chain, shutting down economies around the world, and essentially doing so by creating mass hysteria or fear. I don't know if you remember, at the same time that that report came out, we started seeing all these videos from China, of people, you know, walking around and just collapsing. Um, and then now you go back and look at the videos. Well, you know, the, the, the person catches himself as they're collapsing. So it's not a you know, it's not a true collapse. It's kind of a fake collapse. Uh, so all those are going out at the same time that report's going out. You have all the social media retweeting the report, gets picked up by legacy media. All of a sudden, Fauci says, we don't need a mask. We need a mask. We need two masks. Uh, we need vaccination. We need to vaccinate kids. You know, it's gone. Um, it, it's really, you know, Fauci doesn't really have any credibility uh, remaining because he's changed his position so many times. But if, if you know, Looking at what the Chinese have done, I, I think it's it's really and, and this is in the area of, of of hacking, but it's not hacking systems. It's it's kind of a more sophisticated way of the of the football football analogy that I said where, you know, they got them to hack to, to click on a link. In yeah. this case, we got we got people to be afraid, and then we got um, we got policymakers to basically implement civil liberty destroying policies. Uh, that were based on that fear. What, so what's your, what's your, have you done any work on that? And what's your thoughts? So I've, I've actually, yeah, this is where it gets really interesting because I've done over the years, I've done a bunch of work on uh, nanotechnology and bio nanotech. Now we're not at the point where we can influence through those systems, not by long stretch, we're getting there, but we're not there yet, not by a long way. But to your point, if you look at where we're heading and you look at the information control, it's really interesting to see you know, social media being a perfect example and a perfect use of that. That social media really is the new weapon. I mean, it's it's both amazing and scary at the same time to see how effective that can be. Perfect example, as you said, the toilet paper thing. I mean, good grief. It's toilet paper. I've got, I've got boxes and boxes of toilet paper now. But we have people I'm like, I'm like, ask my wife, like, why are you buying all this yeah. toilet paper? But we have people shooting each other. Corona 2.0. Yeah, yeah, over toilet paper. Oh, the toilet Insane. paper. Insane. I mean, I'm like, good grief. And and that was out of a social media post that was just expanded and everything else. So you take that, you take that one instance. To your point, you also take the corona side of it. We have so much information, disinformation, misinformation floating around that one of the biggest challenges, and we're gonna to continue to see this, is what the heck is the truth? And you've got 300, what, 350, 360, 330 million Americans over here. How do we help them to actually understand what truth is? How do we understand, because I mean, you just saw uh, current administration said, hey, we need to reopen the conversation around what actually happened over in Wuhan. <laughs> Yeah. And Facebook basically said, hey, we're no longer going to censor the fact that this may, may have escaped from the Wuhan lab. I mean, so they're basically uh, basically admitting that they were censoring the tr what could be the truth. Right. I, and that's which so again, gets it, to your point, right? Yeah. 
that's it. Information. I mean, we know that information is warfare, but now the difference is from a military standpoint, we used to be really good at managing that because we could, we could very easily influence. We used to drop leaflets years ago. Then we'd go around with megaphones. You know, we had the ghost squadron that did its job in the Second World War and subsequently. And then we had the obviously the agencies do their counter. I mean, we managed that. Well, the problem is now it's in the hands of everybody. So now you get to a point where, OK, what is reality and and who's managing that reality these days? Who's controlling? Who's dealing with it? Who's influencing it? You know, Wuhan being a perfect example, we're reopening it. So now everybody's bubbling up all of their theories. Well, how do we understand what's an actual, what's a theory? What's somebody just brainstorming and what's somebody who's trying to influence us? Is it the Russians trying to bring stuff in? Is it China bring? Who's, who's trying to influence us and why? Well, and then you have to take into account, you know, the Chinese strategy of essentially becoming the Saudi Arabia of data so they can use it to power their AI. You know, um, one of the things I've thought about is how do you how do you prevent uh, people's information that's collected about them uh, from the, you know, the metadata that comes off their smartphone? Now you're starting to build cameras around cities, so you're tracking people. You get in one of these scooters, they know where you where you going, where you've been. Mm. You know, all this data is being collected about you and it's available to the highest bidder. And then, you know, Silicon Valley companies are basically taking that data and trying to figure out how do they make you buy more stuff. Yep. That's that's not just like you said, going through one door into the garage, into the kitchen. If you if you can influence economic behavior now, social and political behavior uh, come right in there. Um, you know, another one that's that that, uh, you know, I have some a little bit of insider information about is, you know, some of these voting machines, uh, they say that they're not connected to the Internet. When uh, when you tear them down, there's an LTE modem inside. And yep. um, and technically uh, you can't get to the Internet from the modem because it's actually going through a VPN to a server. But isn't that the same as being in clo Colonial's um, system? Yeah, oh, by far and away. So the voting systems, uh, so the, the voting systems is an interesting one. I would argue this is where, quite honestly, I would take my little black truck that I'd borrowed from our friends abroad and, and drop it around to three companies. And I'll be nice enough not to name them on here unless you want me to. But there are three companies that in this country that I would drop that black truck around to. And there'll be some really, really awkward questions. The voting stuff, I'd argue we've done that to ourselves. Yeah, yeah. We, we have been terrible at allowing those companies to go, everything's fine, leave us alone. We've been absolutely awful at holding them accountable. Um, we've been really bad, honestly, at protecting the local and states. Because if I don't want your voting machine, I actually want to use something that is more secure, is more effective, and has had a bunch of hairy hackers break into it. I go to have that conversation. Now you feel slighted and come charging after me and go, well, you shouldn't be allowed to do that. And you bring lawsuits. Um, huge amount of problems with those things. That, I mean, the, the list of issues on voting machines is longer than my arm. That's my biggest problem. But, 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 but yeah. we're saying there's, there's no problem there. That's the thing that's, that's crazy. Uh, and that's, that's it. So we have, with the voting systems, we at least we have the human eye as that secondary factor. Yeah. To, to do the best that they can to count. Now, here's the problem. Because we haven't fixed the darn machines, that opens up all sorts of questions that don't get answered properly. And let's face it, we're humans. We make mistakes. So you've got a mistake-ridden system being unfortunately monitored by humans, which make mistakes. So you've opened yourself up for more questions, more points, more fingers pointed, than you ever needed to do if you'd had just taken the time to hold those companies accountable. Yeah, there's so much. There's so much going on. Um, the uh, the last one. I'm gonna really. I'm gonna. I'm gonna stretch you a little bit here. Boeing 737 Max. <laughs> Isn't that a shit show with wings? So so so. <sighs> You're 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 the CEO of Boeing uh, and and somebody somebody, you know, how do you deal with something like that? I mean, uh, not it, the way it, they it, dealt it, with it. Let's put it that way. You don't wait for two planes to go down, hundreds of people to die before you go. 
oops, we might have made a mistake. And then kind of, and then kind of like uh, like SolarWinds did, they blamed the intern. So, you know, what, what Boeing did is they, they blamed the design and the engine. Again, shit should roll uphill. To your point, that CEO should have done a mayor call and gone, we made a mistake. Engineering should have never allowed it to go. It shouldn't have done it. We shouldn't have used software to try to compensate for an engineering flaw. And then when it didn't work, we blame the pilots. I mean, absolute. That's another one where my little black truck's going to roll up and there's going to be awkward conversations. Yeah. Just. You're you're, you're going to have to have a little lot of little black trucks because, you know, we've just covered, you know, multiple major industries in the United States. And um, and this is not just confined to the United States. It's basically going global. And yeah. so, you know, you're you're king for a day. You're 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 president for a day or maybe I'll, hell, I'll make you president for eight years. Um, how do you clean this up? What's your recommendation? What are some what are some things that we could, you know, that the government could do that should have been done a long time ago? Um, because look, um, I, look, I trained my entire career to drop bombs six thousand miles away from this country. Yeah, yeah, we're not we're not protecting the American people that way. No, it's it's. It, I just talked about you know uh, many different things that directly impact the survival of lives and yeah. had nothing to do with uh, with warfare and the way that I was trained to do it has more to do uh, in, in kind of the way that you're in your world. So you, you're, you're present for eight years. Uh, how do you fix this mess? First and foremost, accountability. You know that from the military world, it's accountability. So when you come up to me and I'm a, I'm a computer security vendor and I turn around to you and say it's 100% effective and it turns out not to be, no accountability. We have no accountability in our infrastructure. We have none in in most of the stuff. So there, the accountability is going to be done. Probably quite a number of lawyers will probably end up in those little black vans. So that'll be. Does this one. this require legislation? You think, or I mean, it sounds like you know we need some kind of new legislation, not just an executive order that can be yeah. overturned in, in 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 eight years. Exactly. This this needs to be. Somewhere this needs to be written on a piece of flipping rock, to be perfectly honest. Um, yeah, it, accountability is huge. Uh, that to me is probably one of the biggest and one of the first things that needs to happen. Um, then we've got in this country 300 plus million vulnerable people. Let's actually help them to help themselves. That to me is a huge part of it. How do I help you to help yourself? How do I? How do I teach you to fish rather than keep giving you stuff? How do I teach you to fish more effectively? You know, we've got, we're all running around with these things. We've all been given these things. We've been told that these things are amazing and they're wonderful and they're great. Yet, yeah, guess what? You know, and I've done this example a few times. This, we all think of this as being lethal. We all think of this <laughs> as being terrible. This, I can kill more people with this. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. So, I mean, to your point, I mean, why why hasn't this been implemented in our education system? Why aren't we teaching uh, uh, digital hygiene or cybersecurity uh, in our education system? That, that's a great point. So I think that's that's one of the things that you're talking about, yeah. right? It's just yeah. having – because nobody ever – you know, if you go get a gun, you have to go through uh, safety training, right, in order to, to get a concealed carry permit or go, get a hunting license. You yeah. have to actually have physical training on the weapon. So what you're yeah. saying is, hey, we're not going to give uh, these kids smartphones. Uh, they're, we're going to give them training first, and they're going to have to demonstrate some acumen and then before we hand it out to them. Is that kind of the, the idea? Yeah, that'd, be, that'd be a huge part of it. Because, again, you, you talk about all of our data being out there. It's because we continue to hand it over. We don't ask the extra question. One or two extra questions. I hand you it. What are you going to do with it? How are you going to take – how are you going to look after me? Oh, you're not. Hmm. Now I'm going to hold you accountable. So that now I've gotten the data and accountability side of it sorted out. Yeah. Now we've got to work on the protection, the knowledge, the information. So you train more people. We work where we did it in the military. We brought people into the military and we trained them. We gave them a trade. We gave them a life. We gave them a career and we did the same thing. When they left, we at least enabled them and gave them the capability. We do the same thing in the security industry. That is the new domain. Let's be perfectly honest. So how do we bring apprenticeship things? through effectively how do we tell companies stop chasing the unicorn when you have an opening jo a job opening don't go chasing somebody with 10 years experience a cissp and 25 certs go get somebody that just stepped out of a bloody uniform 
take some of the government money, retrain the heck out of them, and then you've got somebody loyal for the next goodness knows how long. We need that pipeline needs to be way more effective. Um, yeah. And then the last the last uh, um, discussion I had was with somebody that um, had a lot of experience in the nuclear um, industry or nu nuclear enterprise uh, in the in the Department of Defense. You know, I think the other thing we need to do is we need to harden our infrastructure. You know, one well placed EMP over uh, the top of the United States from say North Korea, the lights go out. You know, uh, I don't know. Do you remember what happened uh, when uh, when Katrina happened? I mean, it was like it was they they, they actually they yeah. flew C seventeens to Iraq. They redeployed the 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 Louisiana National Guard, who was in combat in Iraq. Yeah, they flew them back to to uh, New Orleans, and um, and I remember they interviewed the guys like, "What do you what's it like?" And he says, "I, I doesn't seem like I've left. I I'm in the same kind of environment that I left in combat in Iraq." And so and that was just after you know within a few hours. Uh, New Orleans was a was a war zone, and so think about that one e well placed EMP over the United States and and oh. uh, and, and lights out and and how what's the implications for our society? I mean, you use your phone for everything. You can't get yeah. money. You can't pay for your food. You can't, you know. It, I think it, what will what will be interesting is the, will be the power shift because I mean, you think about North Dakota, South Dakota, Kansas, Nebraska. A lot of those folks now had to cope without one of these things. <laughs> Right, right. So the yeah. power will all of a sudden you have the folks in Nebraska going, all right, now we have a little bit more control. That I would love to see. It's like that you're it's like that song, A Country Boy Can Survive. <laughs> right. Yeah. There we go. And well, so, Chris, it, yeah. This this has been a great conversation. It's uh, you know, I love to do it again. Um, you know, we'll have to, you know, every six months kind of revisit and see. How the, how the world's gone wrong in between. Um, great conversation. I really appreciate you coming on, General Speaking, and uh, look right. forward to the next, next one. Honored. Thank you, sir. Much appreciated.